Pastor Rob Bell, in his book, Love Wins, begins with a story about an art show at his church. <clears throat> Bell explains, I'd been giving a series of teachings on peacemaking, and we were invited to display uh, art and artists. We invited artists to display their paintings, poems, and sculpture, cult sculptures that reflected their understanding of what it means to be a peacemaker. One woman included in her work a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, which a number of, number of people found quite compelling, but not everyone. Someone attached a piece of paper to it. On the piece of paper was written, reality check, he's in hell. Bell then asks, really? He is? We have confirmation of this? There's no confirmation, of course, but we all know why the assumption was made, right? Gandhi wasn't one of us. He wasn't a Christian, so he hadn't been saved. It's what we've always been taught, isn't it? That those who don't believe in Jesus are destined to hell. Through the course of his book, Bell goes on to first question and then argue against that basic assumption. And even the existence of hell as we've classically understood it. Some of you might remember the kerfuffle that ensued way back in 2012 when this book came out, in which many of Bell's evangelical colleagues essentially argued for his excommunication. It seems that his views on the matter of hell made him not one of us, a heretic. Much like John, Bell's former compatriots told him to stop, to be silent, for fear that he would lead others astray and condemn them to hell along with himself. Reading this story today, it's hard not to reckon with this repeated mention of hell where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. But what does Jesus mean when he says hell? He can't mean the fiery cavern with the guys at the horns and the pitchforks in the red pajamas. We have Dante Alighieri and Hieronymus Bosch to thank for that, and they didn't come around for another millennium and a half. It so happens, actually, that Jesus doesn't say hell. The word he uses is Gehenna. Gehenna is a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew words Gehinnom, which just means the Valley of Hinnom. Early in Israel's history, Israelites sometimes worshipped gods alongside of God, and one of those gods was the Canaanite god Molech, the god of the underworld. Now, the cult of Molech worshipped in the Hinnom Valley, outside of Jerusalem. And one of the primary features of Molech worship was child sacrifice. That means that the Valley of Hinnom has, came to be associated with a place where children were ritually killed. Not a place anybody wanted to go, right? After King Josiah abolished that practice, the place was understandably haunted by the memories of such brutal dealings. It became a place where people dumped their trash and where it was burned because to prevent trash from rotting and stinking, you have to burn it. And with such a large city as Jerusalem right there, you can imagine there was always a fire burning somewhere. The fires were never quenched. With its constant reek and its perpetual fires and its dark associations with unspeakable rituals, Gehinnom, surely would have been a hellish place. Now, I suspect that our discomfort with these verses that we read today comes from our own fear of being labeled heretics, thrown into the unquenchable fire. Its very mention is enough to put us on edge, to make us wonder how such a terrible fate could be avoided. What do we have to do to make sure we don't end up there, right? I suppose that as gruesome as the image of amputating hands and feet and plucking out eyes may be, with what we imagine when we think of hell, any of us would be happy to grab the bone saw if it meant that we could avoid it for sure. Oddly enough, I think that is exactly the question Jesus wants us to ask today. What are we willing to let go of 
to avoid the terrors of the place like the Valley of Hinnom. But I can't help but notice that our inclinations reflected in these stories are to cut off people. John wants to stop the unlicensed exorcist, the heretic, right? Joshua wants to silence Eldad and Medad. I wonder if this is why we've taken Jesus' hyperbolic parable and made it into a real place of eternal conscious torment, where rapscallions like Gandhi spend eternity for their tragic lack of luck for not being born white and Christian. If we can point to some defect that makes these people heretics or infidels, then we can assure ourselves that we are safe because they are not one of us. Jesus and Moses, on the other hand, representing God in these stories, show no such inclinations. Remember that as he responds to John, Jesus is still holding the child we read about last week. His words are still hanging in the air. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. To follow Jesus necessarily means standing against some things that are incompatible with the love of God. That's true. But maybe our willingness, or even our eagerness, to determine who is against us, who is not one of us, is the real problem. I wonder if this story is less about cutting off people, and more about cutting off those ideas, those attitudes, those beliefs uh, that keep us from experiencing the fullness of what Christ has to offer. I wonder, what if it's John and Joshua who are in Gehenna in this story? They do, after all, seem to be the ones who are most worked up and most concerned, the ones who are most stressed out by what's happening. Moses, by contrast, is pleased. He says, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, right? He's happy about this. Jesus is adamant. Unwelcoming, such as John has done, is the real danger. Reading this story today in the aftermath of controversies like the one caused by Bell's book and the steady exodus of the church from the church of people who find here only judgment and hypocrisy, I'm forced to wonder, is the way we talk about hell, is our very belief about hell one of the stumbling blocks that's keeping these little ones from knowing Jesus? Have we fundamentally misunderstood what Jesus is trying to say? And is that misunderstanding holding us back from having a deeper relationship with Christ? Is that doctrine of the church a hand that needs to be cut off to keep the body of Christ from ending up in the proverbial corpse pile in Gehenna? As Rob Bell knows all too well, asking questions like these are enough to get a person labeled a heretic. And I'm being recorded right now. (laughs) No one wants to cut off something so familiar and useful as a hand or a foot or an eye. But I wonder if Jesus is asking us to consider what are the consequences of not asking these questions? Is it better to follow Jesus lame? To live in God's commonwealth with one foot or one hand, or to be buried with all of our parts intact. And the question isn't just religious, either. The COVID lockdowns forced us all to experience life in a new way, at a different speed. All those things we took for granted suddenly were interrupted or stopped. Suddenly things that we considered necessities, things like commuting to work, or all the activities that fill our calendars, those things were shown to be expendable. Some of those things we looked forward to getting back, we still look forward to getting back, but others were left pondering if we really need them, if we're maybe better off without them. I wonder, as I think about the state of the world and where we're headed, what necessities, what hands and feet that we're used to living with, can we or should we let go of? 
In a warming world, how badly do we need our daily commutes and our next day shipping? How necessary is it to have everything wrapped in plastic or just to dispose of things that need repair? What other things are keeping us trapped in Gehenna every day? Is, there, is it our desire to live in the right neighborhood? To bring home a bigger salary? To protect ourselves from those people who are not one of us? Is it our insistence that racism is not a problem or our dependence on a constantly growing economy that is keeping us here? What are we willing to amputate to get out of the Valley of Hinnom and enter into life? Maybe amputation is not the best metaphor. I think Jesus uses it to grab our attention, to convince us of the immediacy and the urgency and the gravity of our situation. But the violence of such an image can be off-putting. So let's set it aside for a moment. Let's consider another image. Maybe like me, you've heard a lot about Marie Kondo lately, the tidying consultant. Kondo has a Netflix show where she goes into people's homes and asks them to declutter and helps them declutter and organize their lives. And one of the ways she does this is by asking people to consider each thing that they own and ask, does this give me joy? If the answer is no, she encourages people to thank the items before getting rid of them. Now that might seem silly, but really it's an acknowledgement just that just because the thing is no longer needed, doesn't mean that it never had value. What that is, is a letting go of judgment for having this thing that we don't need. I wonder if that's the key as to how we can move forward as the church, or as a society, or as a species. Perhaps instead of talking about cutting off appendages, it's time to talk about thanking those things that have gotten us where we are, the things that we have loved in our past, but which are simply no longer helpful, which no longer bring us joy, bring us closer to God or one another. We can recognize how these things have been helpful, how they have helped us to grow to the point where we are, while still giving ourselves permission to move beyond them to the next thing. Some things in this world are evil, or toxic or problematic, but not everything is. Most things in life are a little bit of both, good and bad, right? I wonder if what holds us back from letting go of things is the thought that if we get rid of something like this, we're calling it bad, we're saying it has no value, and we don't want to say that. Maybe some things, like the value, excuse me, like the idea of eternal conscious torment or a life, a way of life that prioritizes consumption and, prior, and values greed, maybe those things have had some value and have helped us become who we are. And we can thank them and let them go so we can grow beyond them. Maybe those things are holding us back from welcoming what is next, from moving into the future together, in fact, what if some of those things are unnecessarily cutting people out of our life together? Unnecessarily damaging us and keeping us from entering into God's kingdom. Even some things like doctrines of the church, as we can see, are the products of growth as we come to understand God in different ways. Things like the idea of hell developed over millennium. Maybe we haven't stopped developing. What if some of these things are actually amputating our hands or feet or eyes? And maybe the invitation of this story is to put down the bone saw and enter into new life. Maybe it's worth paying attention to that this story makes us uncomfortable. I think it should make us uncomfortable. 
I wonder if the invitation of the story is to live in that discomfort for a while and see what it does to us, see where it leads us, see where God might be calling us in it.